Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about pluggable optics for networks. Lasers have been around for over six decades. Since their invention, they have found their way into many applications that have changed our lives. Optical communications is, of course, one of them, and there are many that may surprise you. There's also still plenty of room to take laser performance to new heights, leading to even more new applications. This is episode 38, and we continue our conversation with laser and optics expert Juliet Gopinath, professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Next is her project in multi-photon microscopy and super-resolution imaging. Juliet Gopinath is the Alfred T. and Betty E. Look Professor of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering and Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She received her BS degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Minnesota and her MS and PhD degrees at MIT. She was a member of the technical staff at MIT Lincoln Laboratory from 2005 to 2009. Since then, she has led a research group at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her current research interests include ultrafast lasers, nonlinear optics, mid infrared materials, spectroscopy, orbital angular momentum, and adaptive optical devices. She has published 78 peer reviewed journal articles and over 97 conference presentations. She is the recipient of an R&D 100 award in 2012 and is an Optica Fellow. She served as an associate editor for the IEEE Photonic Society Journal from 2011 to 2017, the associate director for Qubit in 2019, and is currently an associate editor for Optica. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast. On Apple Podcasts, you would click the follow button at the top now. We're part of the Cisco Podcast Network. Check out our blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics Blog. All one word, no hyphen, and no spaces. You'll find podcast notes and links there too. For our YouTube playlist, go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. And for product information, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics. And now join me as I talk with Juliet Gopinath. So we, we are committed to two forms of technology. One is what's referred to as multi-photon microscopy. So this is essentially using multiple photons to excite fluorescent molecules. And the images you get back, you get an image, but you can also get some chemical specificity. And then the other thing that we're doing which does not relate to our adaptive optic technologies, we're actually also quite interested in super resolution. So this is resolution below the diffraction limit. So you can image with light Mm -hmm. maybe to around a wavelength. But Mm -hmm. some of the structures that one would want to see, such as dendritic spines, really need higher resolution techniques to do that. And so we're also pushing on that front. Wow. And how, can you, can you give me, give me an example of how, like one way that you can break that diffraction limit? I'd be more than happy to. So in 2014, Stefan Hell won the Nobel prize for a technique that's called stimulated emission depletion microscopy or STED. This is a pretty big mouthful. So let me deconstruct what this means. What this means is that we have a Gaussian beam, just like you would do with regular multi-photon or just regular fluorescence microscopy that excites the sample. And then surrounding it, you have a donut beam of a different wavelength. And in a laser, the laser operates on what's called stimulated emission. So think about it like something tickles your nose and you sneeze. So Mm -hmm. stimulated emission we have, a wa- we have a photon of the wavelength we want to get out, and it goes into the laser medium, and it stimulates emission at that wavelength. So the photons that come out have the same direction, they have the same wavelength, they have the same phase, etc. So now imagine running that process in reverse. This is stimulated depletion. And so what we are doing is we're depleting um, the fluorophores from that upper level with a slightly different 
color. And so if you do this, what happens when you superimpose your donut with your Gaussian beam is you get effectively a smaller spot than one could achieve with classical optics. And that means you will excite less fluorescent molecules and you'll be able to get super resolution. It turns out it scales as the amount of power that is in this depletion or donut beam. And so if you turn that power up infinitely, you should be get able to get infinitely small resolution. Unfortunately, like most things, uh, there are some limits and the limits here are the damage of the tissue. So people can get, people can get, you know, between tens to hundreds of nanometers this way. And um, my lab has been particularly interested in adapting this technology so that we can build a miniature microscope with super resolution. And mm -hmm. our contribution has been looking at how we deliver both the Gaussian beam and the donut beam through fiber and have everything be bend and sensitive so the mouse can run around or do cartwheels or whatever it wants to do oh, wow. and nothing will happen. <clears throat> to the light that is being delivered to the to the miniature microscope. Wow, so you can use the fiber to basically uh, deliver this, both the Gaussian and the donut beam to the local spot on the the brain in the mouse? Yes, that and is the goal. And they don't have to wear a headset, they can just wear uh, the attachment of the fiber to their head or something. So we still need to have a miniature microscope um, oh, okay. and the multi-photon microscopes also have a fiber bundle that comes into them that delivers and also collects the light um, just because of weight, essentially weight restrictions. So mm. we have to be, you know, the mouse can only handle a few grams and we need to be, we need to be sensitive to that. Okay. Wow, that is so cool. Okay, I, I'm still missing something about the the uh, donut beam, though. So you said it's the, the depletion is the opposite of the stimulated emission, right? So the stimulated emission would be the case where you're actually focusing your Gaussian spot on a, a lasing medium. So you're pumping up the... Uh, the electrons, and that's how you get the stimulated emission, but you're 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 imaging a, a brain, which is not a lasing medium. So, so we... where does that depletion come? No, okay, so there's sorry, there's two two things I'm still missing. W w I still don't get the depletion concept. Number one, number two, I still don't get how the donut beam, what function that serves. Yes. So if I just had, I'm going to answer maybe your second question first, and then we'll okay. come back to your first question. So if I just have a Gaussian beam, and I just focus this down on a brain that has some fluorescent molecules, essentially, I will excite them and you'll get fluorescence. But okay. you, will, you will excite kind of a number of fluorescent molecules because you can only focus your spot down to on the order of a wavelength. And so that will limit your resolution. So maybe I excite, I don't know, 10 fluorescent molecules. In the case of the donut beam, what the donut beam is doing is it's superimposed on this Gaussian and it de-excites some of those fluorescent molecules so they cannot be excited by the Gaussian beam. So it basically oh, takes them it. out of commission. So now say instead of exciting 10 fluorescent molecules, I only excite two. So does a, the donut beam have to be a shorter wavelength though? Because, uh, so the or is donut, it like a second order mode or something? The donut beam needs to be on the tail of the fluorescence spectrum. Uh -huh. And so um, essentially, essentially it does need to be a different wavelength in order, um, in order to produce this effect because because it's going to have its own diffraction limit limits that that determine how how narrow the ring is that's is that right one? that's right um 
And uh, but the goal the goal here is to actually use that donut beam to de-excite these fluorescent molecules and take them out of commission. Now, so basically, cutting off the tails of the primary Gaussian. Yes, uh, the, res the resulting fluorescence of the primary Gaussian beam. Exactly. Exactly. And so that donut beam okay. needs to have a very, very deep null in the center. So we don't want any of the photons from the depletion yeah. beam getting into the excitation beam. Now you asked okay. a Got very it. interesting question about fluorescence. So we are actually using what is called optogenetics. And this was discovered by um, uh, some researchers uh, a few years ago and has been widely recognized as the way to study neuronal activity in the brain. So essentially, it, you essentially have genetically modified subjects that express these fluorescent molecules. There is both stimulation and readout. So let me explain. If I illuminate with a certain color and I'm reading out, if my mouse sniffs something and those neurons are activated and I have it illuminated with this color, color, those indicators will fluoresce. Most of them are sensitive to the diffusion of calcium. Okay. And so, uh, because calcium is released when neurons are activated. Stimulation, on the other hand, you can actually do a similar technique for stimulating actually stimulating a neuron. And so the ultimate dream would be to do both stimulation and readout. So these, ref these uh, optogenetic techniques refer, on, refer to, or they're based on molecules called opsins. And so for example, channel rhodopsin is one of the common ones um, that, people, that people use. Um, and there are all kinds of different indicators. People are very, very interested in redshifted indicators right now because then they can use longer wavelength light and that will mm. allow them to go deeper and explore more. Mm, okay. Wow, okay. This is all really cool. All right. It uh, what's What's next? So we've only hit two so far. That was the fourth part of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Next time we'll get into quantum light. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. Subscribe to this podcast, and we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out, share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of network technology and optics. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We're also on all the other major podcast platforms. You may see the Cisco Podcast Network come up when you search for Cisco Optics Podcast. That's where we live, and you can find other great podcasts there, too. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blogs at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog, no spaces and no hyphens. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, product manager at Cisco Optics. The next episode is part five of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Until next time. Mm -hmm.